Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing today? It's good to see you guys. Welcome to church. My name is David. I get the honor and privilege of serving as a lead pastor here. Also want to welcome everybody that's tuning in online right now. So glad to have you guys with us. Well, you came on an exciting Sunday. Uh, We are wrapping up a series called The Promised Land. Uh, And essentially what we've been doing as a church this year is that uh, we are journeying through uh, the whole Bible. And so at the beginning of the year, we started in Genesis, and now we have arrived at Deuteronomy. And essentially all of our messages have been geared towards this Bible reading plan. And uh, by the way, uh, with us um, wrapping up this series next week, that means next Sunday we're going to be getting, uh, we're going to be starting a brand new series called Against All Odds. And my dad is actually going to be here to uh, deliver the message. So I'm excited about that. So make sure you're here next Sunday. Um, but essentially, uh, as we've been kind of journeying through the Bible this year, um, man, we've, we've hit a lot of different themes. And, you know, one, one of our big things is that we're just trying to cover some of the main stories and highlights and show how they point to the gospel. And essentially, that's what we're going to be doing today as we wrap up this series on the promised land. And, you know, um, one, of the, one of the things as, as you've read throughout the Bible this year, if you've been reading along with us, is that you've probably noticed that there's been different covenants that God has made with his people. And, uh, and, and what I want to do today is I want to unpack this idea of covenant. So today we're going to be talking about the promise of a new covenant as we look at the book of Deuteronomy. And so essentially what we see in the first five books of the Old Testament is that there's actually been three covenants that have already been established. Uh, and to, to help us understand what a covenant is, A covenant, according to gotquestions.org, great resource, a covenant is a promise between two or more parties to perform certain actions, okay? So that's what a covenant is. And so it's it's a promise between two or more parties to perform certain actions, right? Now, in ancient times, covenants would not only be made between two equal parties, but also between a king and his subjects. So for instance, the king would promise certain protections And in return, his subjects would promise loyalty to him. So with that in mind, when God has made a covenant with his people, we see that God has made promises towards them, but then requires responses from them. You guys with me? So God makes promises towards man through his covenant and then requires a response from them. And what we've seen in these different covenants is that sometimes these covenants that God has made are either conditional or unconditional, all right? So depending on uh, depending on the covenant. And so so with all that said, some of the things that will uh, that that as we've read through scripture is that when God has made these covenants, they form this unifying thread of God's saving action throughout scripture, okay? And so to kind of unpack this a little bit more, all right? So uh, in Genesis chapter 8 through uh, chapter nine, uh, chapter nine, we see God establishing the no- Noahic covenant, which is where God made a covenant with Noah to never flood the earth again, right? Um, and He also gave some basic principles for humanity to live by. This was an unconditional covenant, meaning God promised it. There was no condition set for this. He said, "I will never flood the earth again." Okay, it was unconditional, right? Thank God. How many guys are thankful that God's God's never going to flood the earth again, right? That's that's a great thing. Then the second covenant that we that we see, and we've touched on this uh, throughout this series, is the Abrahamic covenant, which is where we we see this in Genesis 12, where God calls Abraham and He says uh, He calls him to go to a foreign land. He says, "I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing." Right. And so this is a covenant that he establishes with Abraham, and then he reiterates that covenant in Genesis 15. And then check this out. In Genesis 17, um, not only does he re- reiterate the covenant, right, and, and promise that he's going to have a son because he's older now, and, um, but he also promises that Abraham's descendants are going to inherit the land of Canaan, the promised land. And we talked about this last week, right? And so he makes this covenant, but then he does something interesting to solidify this covenant. Um, God establishes circumcision, right? Now, if you're a guest here today, (laughs) you're probably like, what did I just get myself into, okay? All right, but he establishes this covenant with Abraham and all of his descendants, 
to separate Abraham and his descendants from the rest of the people on the earth, to show that they are the covenant people of God. And we don't have time to get into all the ins and outs of that, but you just need to understand that, that, that that's something that God did to separate his people. It plays into the whole idea of being fruitful and multiplying, right? And so listen to this. This was also an unconditional covenant with the promise that his people, that his descendants would inherit the promised land. That was unconditional. However, there were some conditions to, depending on how they responded. As we saw last week, right, we saw that the first generation of Israelites, they don't get to inherit the promised land. Why? Because they broke God's covenant. And so the, the promised land was unconditional. However, those who would inherit the land, that was conditional depending on how they would respond. So that leads me to say, all right, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but we see the third covenant established in Exodus 19 through 24. We've talked about this already. You can go back and listen to the previous messages, but this is known as the Mosaic Covenant. And essentially during this covenant, this is a conditional covenant that God made between the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. The land of Canaan, the promised land, had been given to Abraham's descendants unconditionally, like I just said. However, remaining in the land was conditional on their obedience and could be forfeited by any specific generation of Israelites. And again, part of this covenant to show that they're God, they are God's covenant people was that all male children were circumcised. All right? So as one commentator said, okay, so just a little, little interesting tidbit, all right? Speaking about this covenant, this idea of circumcision, he, he, this, this commentator said that he revealed, that God revealed that he owns the covenant community in a unique way by his mark of circumcision. He has a special love for his people, and consequently, if they break the terms of his covenant, they will endure a greater wrath than those whom he has not branded. Okay? And so that's why you see God disciplining his people at times because they were in this special covenant. He had separated them. He, he loved them. He, he chose the nation of Israel to be his representatives and he made covenant with them. And so there was a, this was special, okay? So with all that said, I, I, I had to lay the foundation here for where we're going today, all right? And so I encourage you, listen, I encourage you to take notes today because we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into understanding this idea of covenant. So last week, again, we learned that the first generation of Israelites, they, they are there on the border of the wilderness and Canaan, the promised land. And we learned that they were not allowed to go into the promised land it's, because essentially they broke covenant. Again and again, these people, as we have seen throughout this story, they are constantly breaking covenant. They are constantly breaking being rebellious towards God. And so God, who's been rich in mercy and kind and slow to anger, decides to not allow the first generation of Israelites, all those 20 years older and on up, to not enter into the promised land because they broke covenant. So now, that brings us to Deuteronomy. And we just started reading Deuteronomy this past week, and we're going to continue it this week in your own Bible reading. But essentially, what I want to do is kind of give a little bit of an overview of Deuteronomy. And so here we are in Deuteronomy, and this is 40 years later, and they're, this brand new generation is getting ready to enter into the promised land. Now, keep in mind that many of these uh, young people weren't, or weren't even born when their parents cr crossed over the Red Sea. Many of them weren't there at Mount Sinai where God came upon the mountain, delivered the commandments. They weren't there, right? They probably heard stories. Some of them were, were young children. And so what's taking place here in Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of Moses, all right, that he wrote, this is essentially a collection of sermons and instructions that Moses is giving to this new generation to prepare them for the promised land, to prepare them from turning away from the Lord like their parents did, okay? And so that's what Deuteronomy is all about. And this, essentially, this book was written during a 40-day period prior to Israel entering into the promised land, all right? And so, to kind of give a little bit more details about Deuteronomy, okay, 
Chapters 5 through 26, again, is filled with instructions, commands, and laws so that they might know right from wrong. And so, ultimately, that they would just simply love God. See, the, the commands of God are good. As we learned about the Ten Commandments a couple weeks ago, they teach us, they, 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 God was teaching his people how to love him, how to love their neighbor, right? And so, essentially, in, here we are in chapters 5 through 26, Moses is giving all these instructions and commands. Why? So that they might know how to love God. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 6, which is known as the, the Shema, all right, which is, uh, is the Hebrew word that begins the, the most important prayer in Judaism, okay? And it literally means to hear. In Deuteronomy 6, that, uh, modern uh, practicing Orthodox Jews actually recite this prayer every day. In Deuteronomy 6, Moses says, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Everybody say, are to be in your heart. Good job. You're paying attention. So again, ultimately, all these instructions, these commands, it's all about loving God with all of your heart, your soul, and your strength, right? Now, the heart in Scripture refers to the soul of the human being that controls the will and the emotions. And so what God is essentially saying through Moses is that this, old, this covenant is really about an internalization of God's commandments, that they would literally hide his word in their heart. Like God didn't want a bunch of robots just following him aimlessly. He wanted them to truly love him with all their heart, soul, and mind and strength. Why? Because he loved them first. God didn't want them to be just a bunch of robots walking around. He wanted their hearts. How many of you guys have ever done something? How many of you guys have ever been forced to do something, whether it was a law or a command, and your heart just wasn't in it? You know, maybe it was a job, you know, and your heart's not in it. It's just never fun, right? Uh, a couple years ago, kind of illustrate this point, um, I, I was teaching my son how to play basketball, right? And I grew up playing basketball. It's a passion of mine. I love playing basketball. Well, I used to love playing basketball. My wife has retired me now because I'm, anyways, that's a whole other story. But, um, I, and, and, and I remember I was teaching my son uh, because I, he, he had just went, came back from basketball camp. And so I, I was like, yes, this is a perfect opportunity to show him how to play basketball, right? And we got done. I was running all these drills with him. I mean, I was working him like a dog, right? Like I was working him, you know what I mean? We got done at the end of practice, and he's like, he's looking at me, and I thought we were about to have this incredible father-son moment. And he looks at me, he's like, Dad, I just don't like basketball. <laughs> and I was like, okay, son. You know, and in that moment, like I had that, I had, because I, I, I thought about, like you've heard all those stories of professional athletes that were forced to play. Like I remember hearing about Andre Agassi. He said he didn't love tennis but his dad made him play, and he still didn't love tennis, right? But he just got good at it. And so I didn't want to be that kind of dad that was going to force my son. Why? Because his heart wasn't into it. Fast forward to a couple years ago, and we got to watching The Last Dance with Michael Jordan, you know, the whole story. And there was something, if you've never watched it, it's great, it's great. And, uh, it's on Netflix, but a uh, little, little side note there. Um, but it's about Michael Jordan, right? And so my son's watching this, and something sparked within him. And ever since then, man, he's been, he's been really enjoying just playing basketball. And, and like, he goes out, and he literally beat me in horse the other day, and, uh, which I'm, I'm ashamed about. But anyways, but he's, get, he's gotten good. And here's what's happened, though. His heart is into it now. His heart's into it. And it makes a big difference from being forced to do something and when your heart is into, into doing it. You guys with me? And so what God is doing here, he's saying, listen, Israel, I love you. And I just want your heart to be into me. I, I, I'm not trying to co control your life. I just want your heart to be into me. This is why he's constantly showed them his grace and his mercy. He's rescued them and delivered them. Why? Because he wants them to see how good he is and how great he is. And so that why? That their hearts will be into him. Are you guys with me? And so this is why he says here in Deuteronomy 6 that these words I'm giving to you today are to be in your heart. But as we've seen over and over throughout this journey through the wilderness, the Israelites struggled with, 
with loving God and obeying him. They struggle with it. Even though they were his covenant people, right? Even though they had the, the sign of circumcision as the covenant people of God, their hearts struggled with it. And so listen, so fast forward in Deuteronomy 10, listen to what Moses says. He says, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask you except to fear the Lord your God by walking in all his ways, to love him and to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and, and all your soul? What's he doing? He's reiterating Deuteronomy 6. Keep the Lord's commands and statutes I am giving you today for your own good. For your own good. Again, this was all about for their own good. And then listen to this. In verse 16, therefore, circumcise your hearts and don't be stiff-necked any longer. What is God, say, what, what, what is, what is God saying here? This command to, to circumcise their hearts was a commitment, was for them to commit to walk in obedience to the Lord from their hearts. This was, this was meant to be an inner commitment that reflected their covenant with God. And he's saying, circumcise your hearts. Why? Because you're my people. You have the sign of the covenant already on you, but man, your hearts still struggle with following me. And so once again, this is all about the heart. Now check this out. As we go on to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 27 through 30, Moses begins to show them uh, the consequences of keeping or breaking the covenant, all the commands. He says, you'll be blessed if you do this, and you'll be cursed if you do this, right? He's showing them the consequences. And then listen to this. In Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, okay, they renew their covenant to the Lord. Or excuse me, in, in chapter 29, they renew their covenant with the Lord. They say, yes, yes, we, want, we are going to serve you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. However, Moses knows, once again, because he knows what type of people they are, that they, will turn, that they will not keep the covenant. And so what does he do? In verse 29, he warns them about turning away from the Lord. Listen to this. He says, when someone hears the words of this oath, he may consider himself exempt, thinking, I will have peace even though I follow my own stubborn heart. And this will lead to the destruction of the well-watered land as well as the dry land. Again, Moses is telling them, love the Lord God with all your, your heart, right? He's telling them, circumcise your heart. But then he knows, man, even though you guys give lip service to God, because of your stubbornness of heart, like, it's going to get you into trouble. And that's what he warns them about. Like, because of your stubbornness of heart, this will lead to destruction of the well-watered land as well as the dry land. And, and, and basically, again, that's why the promised land was unconditional, but to stay in the land was conditional. And so that's why when we fast forward hundreds of years, like, you see this constant struggle with the, with, uh, the people of God rebelling against him and, being, and their land being destroyed and then eventually going into exile. And so this is almost prophetic what, what Moses is saying here, right? They have a stubbornness of heart, and this is, again, has been the main problem throughout this journey, ever since they were delivered from Egypt, their hearts. So check this out. Chapter 30, Moses also prophetically says that God will not leave them in exile forever. He knows that one day they're going to be taken from the land but he also knows that there's this promise one day. And he prophetically declares that one day after being exiled, listen to what he says in Deuteronomy 36, the Lord your God will what? Circumcise your heart in the hearts of your descendants and you will love him with all your heart and with all your soul so that you will live. So before he's like, circumcise your own heart, but he knows they can't do it. But he says prophetically that one day God will circumcise his people's hearts so that why they will love him with all their heart soul and so that they'll live so check this out you guys with me give me a hand wave if you're with me okay all right all right cool everyone it looks like everybody's with me all right everybody online just click the like button I don't know what you do all right um so check this out the promise that he will circumcise his people's hearts means that God will remove their cold, dead, callous, stiff-necked hearts so that they will truly love him. So, all this to say, all right, this whole idea, old covenant, stiff-necked hearts, the promise of one day God circumcising their heart, this is essentially about the promise of a new covenant. 
And what, what he's talking about here, listen to this, he's talking about the promise of a new covenant. And the new covenant, listen, okay, don't miss this. The new covenant is about heart transformation. It's about heart transformation. Literally, God knows that these people will not keep his commands, their hearts, right? Because of sin. Ultimately, this is, this is what sin has done. It has corrupted humanity. And so the promise of the new covenant is about the heart transformation. So listen to this, all right? I'm tying a thread together, okay, with all this. Around 800 years after Moses said these words to his people, God used a prophet named Jeremiah, all right, just 800 years later, to the, to the, to the same people, all right, the, the, their descendants who have been battling, rebelling against God and being, you know, and all these things. And listen to what Jeremiah the prophet says, 800 years after Moses, he says this. Instead, this is the covenant, he's speaking on behalf of God, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. What's he saying? He's basically reiterating what Moses has said, that God's gonna change their hearts. You guys with me? Check this out. Decades later, another prophet prophesies also about this new covenant and expounds on what Moses and Jeremiah said. Listen to what he says. He says, I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean and I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and all your idols and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. So again, God's reiterating this promise that Moses declared. So listen, this one commentator says that Ezekiel is not speaking of a spiritual circumcision of the heart like Jeremiah or of God writing his law in the heart. Here he's talking about a spiritual cleansing for the heart. Right? This cleansing resembles the purification laws under the Mosaic law that we learned about in Numbers 19. And so this is not a cleansing with water, but a washing by the Holy Spirit who will sprinkle clean water on the soul. Through this washing, the Holy Spirit gives a new heart to the believer. So what do we have here? What is this new covenant all about? It's, it's about a new heart, and it's about a new spirit. You guys with me? So let's fast forward a couple hundred years later. The new covenant that was prophesied hundreds of years ago, guess what? Was fulfilled through Jesus. Now certainly, Jeremiah's prophecy and even Moses' prophecy and Ezekiel, like there is some context to that, that all, and one day all Israel will be saved. We do know that. Some theologians say in the millennium, like this can be somewhat fulfilled. But we also, but here's the thing, the gospel went out, right? The reason why God said to Abraham that I will make you into a great nation and you will be blessed to be a blessing to the nations is why ultimately so that Jesus would come and salvation would come to all people, not just to the Jews. And so listen, when Jesus came, guess what? He came to fulfill the new covenant. So check this out. That means if you're a believer here today, if you're a Christian, you are under the new covenant. Jesus' death, listen, don't miss this. Jesus' death inaugurated the new covenant. See, what we have to keep in mind, all these other covenants, they were always instated with blood. Matter of fact, in Exodus 24, after the Ten Commandments were given and the people agreed to it, many bulls were sacrificed that day to what? In inaugurate the new covenant. So what did Jesus do on the night before he died? Matthew 26 told his disciples, took a cup of wine and had bread, and he said, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What was he referring to? He was referring to his death on the cross, his blood being shed, so that why? The new covenant would come, would be instated. You guys with me? So, I'm trying to tie this all together because I want you to understand how great this is. This is why I like the book of Hebrews. We don't have time to get into all of Hebrews, but man, the book of Hebrews 
was essentially written to Jewish converts who were being tempted to go back to the Old Covenant. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, you, the, the Old Covenant is dead and gone. And he goes on to say, he's like, Jesus was the greater Moses. Jesus was the greater high priest. Jesus offered the greatest sacrifice. But he also points to Jesus be, being the initiator of this new covenant. Listen to what he says here in, in Hebrews 8, verse 6 and 13. He says, but Jesus has obtained a superior ministry and to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been established on better promises. And he goes on to say in verse 13, by saying a new covenant, he's declared that the first is obsolete. So guess what? What does that mean? Everyone who's placed their trust in Jesus is no longer under the old covenant. We are under a new covenant, a covenant of grace. And so what that means now, and we see this language now and in, in, throughout the New Testament, by the way, testament literally means covenant. So Old Testament means old covenant. New Testament means new covenant, right? And so listen to this. And so now we as Christians in Christ, we have received a quote-unquote spiritual circumcision of our hearts. Listen to what Paul says. He says, you were also circumcised in him, with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and when you were dead in trespasses and in this uncircumcision of your flesh he made you alive with him and forgave us all of our trespasses so he's talking about this spiritual circumcision that has taken place in our lives in Romans 2, another verse, Paul talks about having a circumcision of the heart. And this is for us as believers in Christ Jesus. And so what does this mean for us, okay? This means we have been given new hearts. This means we have been given new hearts. Again, going back to Hebrews, I encourage you to read Hebrews 8 on your own today, sometime this week. And what does he say? Hebrews, author of Hebrews, talks about this new covenant, and then he reiterates Jeremiah's prophecy, speaking about this new covenant, showing us how it's been fulfilled in Jesus. He says, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. See, this is so important for us. It's so important for us to understand. This is why we celebrate communion, because it's about the new covenant that we're under. And so check this out. Again, the problem with the Old Covenant is that it didn't have the ability to change hearts. This is why the Israelites struggle. Of course, they had free will, and they, you know, you do see people responding in faith at times, but man, there was this constant struggle with their hearts. They tried to obey externally, but they didn't have the desire to obey from the heart. And listen, having a stubborn heart is not just a problem for the Israelites, it's the story of humanity. It's our story, apart from Jesus. We see this over and over throughout Scripture where it's reiterating that, man, the heart is deceitful above all things. It talks about in Ephesians 4, talking about unbelievers that, do, that haven't put their faith in Christ. It says that they are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of why? The hardness of their hearts. Man, apart from Jesus, my heart was stubborn. Romans talks about that we are hostile towards the things of God, right? There's this just struggle. And so this is the story of humanity, which is why Jesus had to die. He died not only for the forgiveness of our sins, but to usher in this new covenant. Why? So that we could be given a new heart and a new spirit. And so listen, this is essentially, all right, if you're taking notes, this is essentially why Jesus said we needed to be born again. All this language kind of ties together. And I'm just kind of giving you a 30,000-foot view with this, okay? This is why Jesus said we had to be born again. In John 3, 5, he says, Truly, I tell you, unless one, someone is born of water and of the Spirit, and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Where's he getting that language from? You guys remember what Ezekiel said hundreds of years earlier? He was talking about being washed clean and the Spirit being given Jesus is essentially referring to Ezekiel's prophecy that the Lord would sprinkle clean water. And so this isn't talking about physical water, all right? 
He would sprinkle clean water on the sinner to purify them and put his spirit within them. That's what Jesus is referring to. He's referring to the new covenant that's about to happen because he knows that he's about to die. And he says, unless one is born again, they cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is what it means to be born again. New hearts, new spirit. This is what Paul is saying in, in many of his letters. He says it in Titus. He says, when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, listen, he saved us not by works of righteousness. He, he didn't save you because you did enough good works. He didn't save you because you were good enough, because you were moral enough. It says he saved us, right, because of his kindness and his love for us. He saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but why? According to his mercy, his grace. This is what makes the gospel just so scandalous. That God came to save people who did not want him, who were stubborn in their hearts towards him, but he came and died in their place, took their punishment for their sins so that they could be redeemed. And then listen, his, this is mercy because all of us deserved hell. All of us. All of us stand guilty before God. But God had mercy on us. And listen to what he goes on to say. He saved us, right? Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through what? The washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Do you see the language there? He's using the same type of language about being born again, about having the spirit inside of you, the washing of regeneration. Regeneration literally means rebirth. He's reiterating the importance of how you as a believer, if you're saved today, is because you were born again. It's this washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing, regeneration brings such radical change. This is one of the aspects of the gospel that really, again, makes it such good news. Because so many times people think they just have to clean their act up before they come to God. Listen, friends, you can't clean your act up. Because why? You can't change your own heart. Only God can do that. And it only comes when you put your faith in Christ. And this is why many of us, and listen, some of us, we all have our own stories. Like, when we get saved, none of us are perfect, but some of us, we experience just changes in us, right? Why? Because the Holy Spirit came into our lives. He did something. He washed us. He regenerated us. And so listen to this. So here, I'm, now I'm going to get a transition now because I said all that to say this. What does this mean to have a new heart? What does that look like? What does this all mean? And my hope, literally, literally my hope has been that, man, for those of you who are, to all my Christian friends, right, that today that you would just see how awesome the new covenant is. But my, my hope is for any of my non-Christian friends to see the importance of being born again. Because, man, this is so special. This is why Christianity isn't just a bunch of rules to live by. It's not about becoming a moral person. Yes, God does do that in your life. But literally, Christianity is about dead people coming alive in Christ. And that's what Ephesians 2 is talking about. Literally, it's meaning we were dead in our sins, right? Our hearts were far from God. But God, when we put our faith in him, God makes us alive. He makes us born again. And so listen, So, and when that takes place, listen, all right, don't miss this. What does this mean, having a new heart? It means, number one, that our deepest desires are now to love God and obey him. Our deepest desires are to love God and obey him. This is why Jeremiah said, I will put, when God said, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. What was God saying? I'm going to give my people who accept my son a desire now to want to love God me and obey me a desire that's listen this doesn't mean we don't have free will it doesn't mean we won't sin <laughs> doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes doesn't mean that sometimes we're just stubborn what it does mean though is that our deepest desires as a believer now 
want to please God. How many of you guys, okay, case in point, some of us may, may be having a hard time understanding this. If you're a Christian in here this week and you did something wrong, how many of you guys felt that? You, you, you felt bad about it, right? Immediately. <laughs> That's good news. That's the Spirit of God inside of you <laughs> prompting you. Why? Because your deepest desires now are to love God and do what's right. We don't always do what's right. We will make mistakes. We still have choices. It's just that our desires change, right? This is what it means. We have our hearts circumcised. They now belong to God. The Spirit's inside of here. I love Charles Spurgeon. He, he gave this amazing illustration of, of being born again. He said, imagine if you have two plates of food and, and, and a pig, right? And one plate has the best food in the world, like Ruth Chris Steakhouse, right? And the other plate is filled with a bunch of trash. Guess what plate the pig is going to go to? The trash. He's going to go to the trash. Why? Because that's all he knows. That's his nature. That's his desire. He's just going to eat out of trash. Why? Because he's a pig. He's a pig and nothing else. Now, Spurgeon says this, but if I snap my fingers and I can supernaturally change that pig into a man, guess what? He will stop eating the trash. He's not a pig anymore. He's disgusted by the things he used to do. He's ashamed. Why? Because he has a new nature and new desires. Amen. He is a man now, and now he will live the way a man is supposed to live. And that's what God does for people who come to him. He changes their desires. This is why some of us, man, when we, got, when we first got saved, it's like, man, you know, you went from partying and being a heathen to all of a sudden now you're just like wanting to read your Bible. Like things change. doesn't mean you couldn't go out and party. doesn't mean you, you didn't have the choices to make and you weren't tempted by those things. It's just that now there's something that has taken place. Your deepest desire is what? To love God. Are you guys with me? This is what makes the gospel such good news. And so as Christians, even though we're, we have new desires to love God and obey him, we will be tempted. Why? Because as long as we are here on this earth, there's always going to be temptations. We still struggle with our flesh. And we're going to read a verse here in just a moment. As one pastor said, though, when we do give in to sinful desires, what happens? Our deepest desires remain unmet. And we are miserable until we repent and live in obedience to God and the deepest desires he gives us. It reminds me of the prodigal son. <laughs> what happened to the prodigal son? Do you, you do realize the prodigal son was a son. He, he wasn't a slave. Like, he was in his father's house. He had an inheritance, but what did he do? He wanted, he was tempted by the world, and he went out, and he, guess what? He, he partied, he lifted up, but do you know what it says? It says he came back to his senses, and he realized he had it better in his father's house. What was happening? I believe, I believe this is a picture, right, of believers who do stray. It's just, man, there's something that just doesn't sit right. And so why? He had this desire to go back to his father's house. There's some of you here today. You've been strained. You've been running around like a prodigal. But it doesn't sit right. It doesn't sit right. Why? Because God did something. God did something. And this is such good news for us, friends. God says for us to love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and he knew that we couldn't. So what does he do? He now changes our desires when we put our faith in him to why now to truly love him, as Paul says, to be obedient from the heart. He changes our desires. And, here's, and, and so listen to this. Here's a verse for you guys, okay? To see the struggle. Because again, Scripture says that we are going to sin. If anyone thinks that they are without sin, they deceive themselves. Okay, we're going to be tempted, all right? Where are we tempted from? We're tempted by our flesh. The flesh. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 5. He says, I say then, walk by the Spirit. How can you walk by the Spirit? You, you can because you have the Spirit now inside of you. You are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He now lives inside of you. He has changed your heart. Walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. See, again, we still have choices to make. If we walk by the Spirit, we're going we're gonna, to you know, tap into those desires of the Spirit, right? 
But if we walk by the flesh, listen to what he says, we will not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. So that's where we struggle at times. Our deepest desires are lining up with the Holy Spirit, but sometimes our flesh, <laughs> we struggle with our flesh. But if you're a child of God, the fact that you are struggling the fact that you are wanting to do what's right, the fact that, like, even, even for instance, okay, like, I know, like, past couple of weeks, man, some of the messages have been challenging. And listen, I'm a grace guy. I'm all about grace, but, man, something, God, God challenges us sometimes with his word. And it's amazing to me, like, sometimes the most challenging messages, is like, and not that I'm looking for people to say, pat me on the back or what, but it's amazing to me, how, like, how many people were like, man, that was such a good word. That was, like, that really challenged me. Why does that happen? Because the spirit of God inside of us, our deepest desires are saying yes to that. I want to do God's will. I want to be obedient. I want to be like Caleb and Joshua, Why, right? That's the spirit of God inside of us testifying to that. But here's the deal. Not only have our desires changed, but listen, now that the Holy Spirit is inside of us, guess what? Not only do we have new desires, but now the Holy Spirit empowers us to love and obey God. He gives us power to love and obey God. See, the, whole, the, the old covenant did not provide the means to obey God. That's why the commandments remained externally on the outside and never made the mark on the worshiper. They didn't have the power to obey. This is why God was like, you know what? I'm just going to do something different. <laughs> All those who put their faith in, in my son, I'm not only going to give them new desires, but now I'm going to empower them as they submit to the Holy Spirit in their lives. So this is, again, this is, remember what, what Ezekiel said? I will give them a new heart and I'll put my spirit inside of them. Remember what Jesus said? You must be born again in, you know, by washing uh, with, in the Holy Spirit. And Paul talks about the regeneration. What is that? The Holy Spirit now dwells in us. The moment you put your faith in Christ, guess what? The Holy Spirit made resonance into your life. And so listen to this in Romans 8. Romans 8, Paul says it like this. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law, right? Paul's talking about here, he's talking about an unbeliever. He's talking about someone that's not a Christian. He says, the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. But those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, listen, he's talking to Christians now. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And what's the qualification? If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. I mean, so if anyone has not put their faith in Christ, the spirit of God is not inside of them, and it's, they're going to have a hard time trying to ever live for God. But if you have put your faith in Christ, guess what? The spirit of God is inside of you. And the same spirit, Scripture says, that raised Christ from the dead is the same power in you. And so the Holy Spirit, man, he changes our desires. He gives us a new heart. He gives us a power now to live for him. And this is the promise for everyone that is a believer. Again, doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. Doesn't mean we're not going to fall short. Doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. We're still in this process of sanctification. It's just that now our desires have changed and we have power from the Holy Spirit to enable us to live out our faith in Christ. Friends, isn't that good news? Amen. So to all my non-Christian friends, we're going to respond today. And I, I want to speak to any non-Christians, all my non-Christian friends that are listening right now. I want you to know that God loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you and wants to have a relationship with you, but here's the thing. It's not about good works. It's not about obeying God. It's not trying to clean yourself up. It's not about keeping the law. You have to be born again. You must be born again. Because scripture says that we are spiritually dead apart from Christ and only God can make us alive. 
And guess what, friends? If you put your faith in Christ today, if you repent of your sins and you put your faith in Christ today, guess what he will do? He will give you the promise of the new covenant. He will give you a new heart with new desires and a new power to live for him. He will change you and he will sustain you. And the call is for you just to simply believe that Jesus Christ died for you and rose again and to confess him as the Lord of your life today. To all my Christian friends, hey, listen, this is why we take communion. Don't take this lightly. The reason why we partake in communion is why? Because of the new covenant, because of the gospel. Realize that when you put your faith in Christ today, God's spirit came inside of you. He regenerated you. He made you come alive, and he gave you a new heart with new desires and a new nature, and now he is empowering you to live for Jesus. And so remember that today. I want you guys to do me a favor and stand with me as we pray and we get ready to respond. We always have this time of response at the end of our services because we don't believe in just rushing you out of here. We believe that right now the Holy Spirit's working in people's lives. There's some of you today, man, you've been running from God, but God is calling out to you today. Man, surrender to him. There's some of us as believers here today, man, we needed to be reminded. Maybe we've been like a prodigal, and God in his grace and kindness is saying, you're my son, you're my daughter, you belong to me. Some of us just need to respond to us by remembering the new covenant by partaking in communion. Just bow your heads and let's pray. Father God, we, we come to you right now. We thank you for the scandalous grace of the gospel. Because of your son, because you loved us so much, you sent your son Jesus to die for our sins. Not only to die for our sins, but to usher in the new covenant, to change our hearts, to transform our hearts. God, what amazing grace that is. Lord, we thank you today. And Father, right now, I ask you to just cause those who don't know you to be born again to a living hope in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Friends, right now, we want to invite you to come forward. For those of you who are Christians, we want to invite you to come and remember the Lord's uh, covenant that he made with us through his blood by partaking in communion. For those of you who maybe want to just receive Jesus today, we also invite you to come forward. I'll be standing down here myself. Uh, our faith coaches, we'd love to talk with you. If anyone just needs prayer about something, uh, feel free to come forward as well. All right, go ahead and let's respond.